Hey guys, it's the day we plant our tomatoes and our peppers. So I'm excited about it. It's been put off for way too long. Well, the peppers had to be because of the weather. Um, we've been, it's still, it's June. It's still, we've got cool weather, cloudy days, had some rain a couple of days ago. Um, and you really wanna wait until your nighttime temperatures are well into the 50s, 55 and above, uh, if possible, because putting peppers out too soon just stunts their growth. And sometimes they never recover from that. Tomatoes, on the other hand, I've just, been putting it off for much too long. Um, you know, I planted them quite a while ago. I sowed the seeds in the solo cups and they're ready. I mean, we're producing tomatoes in these solo cups and the leaves are looking a little bit purple, which uh, is just a nutrient deficiency. So getting these in the ground will definitely help and kind of get rid of that. But they'll be okay. Tomatoes are very resilient. Pepper plants are the same. I brought them out um, maybe a little bit too early. They have some leaf curl, which is basically just a symptom of kind of some shock. They have a little purple veining as well, so they need some more nutrients. And for both of these, just getting them in the ground is gonna make a world of difference and they're gonna take off and do just fine. So I'm gonna gather these plants up, get to the planting site, and we'll talk a little bit further. All right, so I've got a few different varieties laid out here. I've got super steak, super sauce, uh, Sun Gold, Pink Princess, and of course, Kellogg's Breakfast, my favorite tomato. And then a friend of mine gave me um, Bush Steak, which I believe I talked about these in the video, Best Tomatoes for Your Zone, for Your Area. I'll put a link up here for that. But uh, he brought me four of these that he grew from seed. And these are a, a steakhouse type tomato, a beef steak tomato that grows on a small plant, like a determinate plant. So that brings us to the types of tomatoes there are. And that is determinate, indeterminate, and then there's a semi-determinate, which is kind of in between the two, and then a cherry tomato, which mostly is indeterminate. There are a few smaller types that are determinate. So what does all that mean? A determinate tomato, like these bush steaks, like Roma, those grow to a certain height, generally about three feet tall, and then they produce all their tomatoes pretty much at one time, and then they're done. The season is over for them. An indeterminate tomato is one that, and this is probably most of the tomatoes that you can grow, uh, those are tomatoes that continue to grow, and they produce, and they continue to grow taller, produce, continue to grow taller, produce, and keep going until cold weather comes to kill them. Now, if you have a really long growing season like I do, where we have tomatoes that grow through the winter even, uh, indeterminates are great because they will produce through that whole time. Now they will slow down in the winter cool weather. They won't be like they're producing in summertime, but they will keep going. Now I don't prune my determinate tomatoes. I don't prune my cherry tomatoes unless they're getting too big and they need to just be kind of wrangled in a little bit. Um, but I definitely do prune the indeterminates, and I will show you how to do that once I've got these planted. So we're gonna start with tomatoes first, and then we'll do peppers. Now, most tomato plants need to be supported. However, the bush steak only grows a couple of feet tall, and so it doesn't need maybe any support. I've never grown this variety before, so we'll see. I'm not gonna start out with any support, but for most of your determinate types of tomato, like if you're growing a Roma tomato, um, a general, you know, tomato cage from the hardware store or wherever will work. Um, make sure they're sturdy though. A lot of tomato cages are so flimsily put together that they start to, the rings start to break off before you even get them home. So I'm gonna plant this right here uh, in this bed. I'm not gonna plant it with all the rest of the tomatoes. To save space, I'm just gonna plant these because they're fairly small, just in some little pockets that I've got throughout the vegetable garden. So with tomatoes, no matter what kind they are, you want to plant them deep. Now, the problem is these beds here are only six inches deep. Now, they have uh, the smaller roots can access the native soil below. However, because I have gophers, I have to put gopher wire, which is it's now six inches under this. So I can't dig a hole any deeper than six inches. The roots can grow uh, further down than six inches because they can grow right through that gopher wire. And the thing with tomatoes is they will develop roots all along their stem. So unlike most things, 
you want to plant them deep because if you plant them up to here, they're gonna grow roots all the way along the stem under the ground. And that's just gonna develop a much stronger, more productive plant. But in a six inch deep bed, you can't really do that. So there's a little trick. Pop these out here. Just mess up the roots a little bit. And we're going to lay it on its side in this hole. So we get all that stem under the ground. Now it's only a few inches deep, but it still is gonna allow for more root growth. I wanna put in some fertilizer and I use Neptune's Harvest Crab and Lobster and Neptune's Harvest Kelp Meal. Uh, I like the, the crushed crab and lobster shell. It, the way it's crushed, it makes different sizes in the crushing. And so you can see large pieces of shell, you can see tiny powdery pieces of shell. But the thing is, those small pieces, the smaller the piece, the faster they're going to be uh, dispersed and taken up by the plant. And then the, the bigger the pieces, they're going to slowly break down over the next couple of months and give a kind of a slow release fertilizer as well, but it's all natural. Those crab and lobster shells are great uh, sources of nitrogen and phosphorus and calcium, which is really important. A lot of tomatoes, um, if they don't have enough calcium, they will get blossom and rot. Now, typically that's not because there's a lack of calcium in the soil, it's just a uh, lack of being able to draw in that calcium. And the best remedy for blossom end rot is more even watering, because when it's not watered well, it cannot bring the calcium up into the plant and therefore you'll get blossom end rot. Now, one thing people swear by for blossom end rot is Epsom salts. Now, people may swear by it, but there's actually no evidence that this works. I did a whole video on it. I'll leave a link up here and down below. In fact, the magnesium in the Epsom salt can actually uh, block some of the calcium that's in the soil from being absorbed by the tomato plant, which is the exact opposite of what you want to do. So I will put Epsom salts in a tomato plant in a pot because you can't guarantee the magnesium is going to be in that pot and tomatoes do need magnesium. But in the ground, very rare that a soil will be deplete of magnesium. So I won't be using Epsom salts today. Uh, Neptune's Harvest also has kelp meal, and kelp is a really great source of potassium, which tomatoes really need. And it's also got a natural growth hormone that helps produce a really strong root system. So now that we've got our fertilizer in there, we're gonna lay the plant on its side and just cover all of that up and just kind of gently bend the stem so that that last bit is out of the soil. And you can take the leaves off of that part we're burying or not, it doesn't really matter. And then I'm gonna replace the mulch. Mulch is so important for, for your whole garden, uh, but tomatoes are moisture lovers and this keeps the moisture in the soil and it keeps the weeds down. And then remember to label it so you know what it is. Typically you're gonna plant determinate tomatoes about three feet apart to give them good airflow through the plant and between each other to keep down diseases. Now there's a little more to talk about when it comes to indeterminate tomato plants. Uh, for one, it's a much bigger plant if left to grow how it wants to. Like I mentioned before, indeterminate tomato plants are going to grow and grow and grow until the cold weather comes to kill them. So how do we maximize the harvest for that amount of growth? Well, first of all, it's important to know that uh, they're going to produce a lot more leaves than they are fruit if left to grow naturally. If you've left to, uh, an indeterminate tomato to grow in its natural way along the ground, it's going to take up a space that is probably, I mean, it could be 10 feet in diameter, one plant. But out of that 10 feet, you're not gonna get a ton of fruit. You're not gonna get 10 feet worth of fruit because a lot of the plant's energy is going into producing that plant. And what the plant wants to do, if it was you know, in nature, is take advantage of that ability to put down roots along the stem. And so as it grows and flops over, it's going to put down roots in that area where the stem touches the ground. It also wants to grow as far as possible because every once in a while, it's gonna put on a truss of fruit and wherever it has traveled to, it's going to drop that fruit on the ground or it's gonna be laying on the ground, so the fruit's gonna rot fast or be taken by 
rodents or whatever, <clears throat> and it's going to drop its seed and be able to kind of reproduce that way. So that's its goal. It's not, uh, its goal is not to feed us. And a lot of people argue with me on this. Um, I, it's a very well-known practice, pruning indeterminate tomatoes and taking out the side shoots, which I'll show you. But uh, people want to argue with me and that's okay, but I have produced so many tomatoes in tiny little beds like this. At my last house, I produced over 300 tomatoes in one year from about 50 square feet uh, in raised beds. So let's plant one of these and I'm going to show you how to prune it and trellis it to produce maximum amount of fruit for the least amount of space. And when we're done, you will see I'm going to be planting these about a foot apart. And pruning your tomatoes is not just to focus the energy on tomatoes rather than leaves. It's actually going to say, especially if you live in a humid climate, it's going to save you from a lot of disease that will take your tomatoes out in humid weather because you're going to get a lot more airflow through the plants than you will if it's left to grow like a jungle. So these are going to be planted the same exact way as we did the other one. I'm going to throw in some fertilizer. And this bed had peas growing in it all winter long. So peas are a legume and they leave some nitrogen in the soil. So you should have a little bit of extra nitrogen. Then we're gonna take the plant and I'm gonna pull off some of these just for demonstration because I want you to see kind of how much is going under. I'm gonna leave it at that. This is a super stake. Really good root system there. Just wanna mess the roots up a little bit so they can it stimulates more root growth and it gets them out of the shape of the cup and uh, gets them going into the soil. So now we want to just gently kind of bend this up a little bit. Fill that hole back in. Kind of remember where this was so you don't plant the next one right on top of it. Now, if you can see here, you've got the main stem going up, it goes straight up. And you've got another stem coming out here where the leaf meets the main stem. I call it the armpit. So right in that junction there is this growth coming out. And that's going to happen all the way up the main stem. Now each one of these is going to take off and produce a ton more leaves with very little fruit. So every single one we're going to pinch off just like that. Now you can put these in water and start a whole new plant if you'd like. Now the flowers actually look very different. They come off of the stem. They are not in an armpit. They come directly off of the stem. We're gonna leave those, of course, because those are what's gonna become our tomatoes. So now how are these tomatoes supported? Well, with this trellis structure overhead. Now I've been very fortunate to have the number one tomato growing video of all time on YouTube. It's got close to 12 million views now, I believe. And um, so I've been able to have people send me pictures from all over the world of my trellis system here in their own yard. And they've, and a lot of them have their own take on it, you know, so it's not exactly the same. And this coming week on Next Level Homestead, uh, our other channel, and I'll put a link up here and down below. And on that channel, we do more of kind of the building of the gardens, not necessarily gardening. Uh, but I will be putting a third section here on this top terrace for tomatoes or cucumbers. I grow cucumbers the same way. And so I'll be building that part of the trellis. But in a nutshell, we've got vertical supports. We've got two by fours going across the top with two by threes going the other way. And then we use these tomato hooks, which uh, are available on our website. And as far as I know, we have the best quality and the, the uh, lowest cost of any out there. Now, it's always difficult to show, I've always had a problem showing how these work at this time of year because the plants are so small. So, so I'm just going to insert a tiny bit of video here of a video I did a few months ago when we still had tomato plants growing here full size. So you get a little bit better idea of how these work once the tomatoes are up and growing. Typically, depending on your length of growing season for tomatoes, uh, you, if you grow them one stem, let's say up a string, or up a bamboo cane, whatever, you can use anything. Once it gets to the top of that structure, it starts to flop and either break off or cause disease or just start looking unsightly, growing in different directions. It's hard to maintain. So typically what you do is you cut it off. And what does that do? That stops your tomato production. 
Now, obviously you can't raise your trellis. That would be pretty difficult to do to get more time on your tomato, tomato vines. But with the hooks, once your tomato reaches the top, all you have to do is unhook the string, let out a string or maybe a turn, a turn or two and hang it back up. Now you've gained that much more space to let your tomato grow. If the season continues and it gets back up to the top again, guess what? Let out some more string and give them some more space to grow. So there's a couple of ways to do this. I use um, landscape staples and I just put it right there at the base of the plant. Try not to stab the, the stem as you go down if you've laid your plant in the ground like I have. Uh, you can also bury the string under the root ball. That's another way of doing it. And then you take the plant and you just gently twist it around the string. Now the best time to do this is midday when they're kind of a little more floppy because they have less water in them. And there are clips that you can use for this, but I find it's just an extra use of plastic and an extra cost, and this works just fine. So now the only job would be, other than to keep it watered and fertilized, which we'll talk about, uh, is let this plant grow up this string. So every few days, come through your tomato patch, pluck out the side growth that are coming from the armpit, and give them a twist around the string. As long as you do that every three, four days, maybe even longer, depending on the speed of growth, um, they're gonna reach the top, and then like in the video I just showed you, you'll be able to lower them down and keep them growing. So in terms of watering and fertilizing, I highly recommend drip irrigation for a few reasons. It saves water, you get to only get water right where you want it, and it doesn't get the leaves wet. Um, a problem with tomatoes is getting the leaves wet, they start to become susceptible to fungal disease, like blight, uh, especially in humid climates. Now, obviously you can't control the rain, it will rain, but let's control what we can. Number one, by not spraying them ourselves with water. And number two, by keeping them pruned so that that airflow can come through there and dry those leaves off if it does rain. I also have an aspirin prevention program video that I will link. I think it's the same video as the Epsom salt video. And that will show you a really quick solution that you can do to prevent disease in your tomatoes. And then the only other thing I do is every three weeks or so, I will use uh, Neptune's Harvest tomato and veg formula. It's a great mixture of nutrients and minerals for your tomatoes to keep them growing strong and to keep them productive throughout the season. Now, a couple of years ago, I think it was 2020, we actually did Tomato Tuesday. And every Tuesday, I had a tomato video. And I banked a lot of those in a playlist that I will link down below so you can get all the information you could ever want about tomatoes. But right now let's switch to peppers and then I'll come back at the end and show you all of these planted with the strings attached. Now I've found through this channel that a lot of people didn't know that peppers are actually perennials. Now in zones 9, 10, and 11, they can just stay in the garden all winter. You do have to cut them back a little bit in the fall and possibly in zone 9 protect them a little bit. But we actually had a lot of frost and a lot of hail this winter that's completely uncharacteristic. And they did have a harder time and they did take a while, but they are coming back strong now. So if you plant peppers with me right now, you're gonna wanna save them. And even if you live in zones one through eight, you can still keep your peppers year to year. And I have a video that I will link up here and down below that will show you how to do that. So make sure you watch that because why plant again and wait for the baby plants to grow when you can winter them over and already have buds and even some peppers hanging on them at this time of year or earlier. Now I've got three different varieties of peppers here. I've got Red Knight, I've got Cupid, and I've got Shishito. Now if you notice, most of these pots have two peppers in them. Uh, growing side by side, I planted two seeds per pot. And most of them, if not all of them, came up with two. Now. A lot of times for most plants, I would want to thin them to just one. And so you could just cut it off or you could kind of slowly tease it out and replant it somewhere else. But with peppers, they actually like to have a partner growing right alongside them. So I won't be doing any thinning here. I'm gonna plant them just like this. Now, even though peppers are nightshades, just like tomatoes, they don't want to be planted deeper than what they already are growing. So we're not gonna dig a deep hole and bury the stem. 
They also don't need much nitrogen in the beginning because peppers will take nitrogen, any amount, and run with it and produce a ton of leaves, and you guessed it, not a lot of fruit. So I'm not gonna be using the Neptune's Harvest Crab and Lobster. Uh, there's just too much nitrogen in that. I am gonna be using the Neptune's Harvest Kelp Meal by itself because that's a great source, like I mentioned earlier, of potassium and natural growth hormone to really make the root system grow and then give back in fruit. Let's dig just a little hole here the size of that pot. So the first number on any fertilizer is nitrogen. The middle number is phosphorus. The last number is potassium. So we have a 102. So very little nitrogen. Does have potassium. We don't need a ton of it. Uh, we don't have any phosphorus in this. So I'm going to add that to the hole. But then for phosphorus, I'm going to add a handful of bone meal. And bone meal is pretty much all phosphorus. All right, we're just going to put that in the hole. Cover it all up with the soil and then replace the mulch. Now in three or four weeks, I will start to fertilize with the tomato and veg is a 242. So it's lower in nitrogen and potassium, but higher in phosphorus. And it's also got some really great uh, materials in here. It's got humates, that nice black stuff that you get from compost. It's got that in here. It's also got yucca extract, which is a wetting agent. It holds moisture in the soil, which is what tomatoes and peppers need to avoid that blossom end rot because they both get that issue. So this is a great product. It's what I use every three weeks, um, starting about a month after planting in the ground. Now peppers like a lot of sun. They like a lot of heat. Like I said, if it's not 50, 55 degrees at night or above, don't bother putting them out yet. Now, when it comes to sun, they te technically like full sun. However, too much sun can cause the fruit to get sun scald. And so that hot afternoon sun, when I lived by the coast, that was my nemesis, that hot afternoon sun. So I would shade one side of them, the afternoon sun side, uh, with either plants or shade cloth or whatever to keep that sun off of them in the afternoon. However, when I moved here, last summer was our first summer growing here, I found that even midday sun all the way to the afternoon was too hot. And so I would throw some shade cloth over kind of the top and this, the sunset side. So they got good morning sun and then they got, it was 30% shade cloth. So they got just a little bit of sun for the rest of the day. And they did much better. I did that halfway through the season after the first batch, almost all the, the fruits got sun scald but then the second batch and, and later flushes of fruit were just fine. Now, another thing about peppers, um, one of the reasons they like to be planted two at a time is because they can kind of hold each other up, but they will need to be staked because they will get top heavy once they're loaded with fruit. And so any type of steak, um, it doesn't need to be heavy duty. Mine has to be thin enough to fit through the gopher wire. So those little bamboo steaks at the garden center that come in a bag, um, they only need to be about two feet tall, stick six inches or so in the, in the ground. Uh, or you can just use a stick from something you've pruned and then tie them to that with, you can use the green tape, but um, green tape doesn't biodegrade, maybe in a few hundred years, but uh, this is something I found. It's an elastic, I guess it's for making clothes or something, but it's elastic. And this will biodegrade in a much faster time period. So you can cut it off. It still has the stretchiness, so it will grow with the plant. Um, but it's going to offer good support and be a little more uh, environmentally friendly. And you really, most of the time, won't need to tie them on and on throughout the season. When they're up about a foot, if you tie both of the main stems to the stake, that's pretty much going to hold them up for the rest of the year. One more thing I would recommend, um, especially if you're in a longer growing period, if you have a really small growing window, if you have a short season, you may not want to do this, but everybody else, I would say once you've got about six leaves on your plant, pinch out the top growth, and that is going to send the rest of that energy back down into the plant to produce more branches, which is going to give you more fruit, and it's not going to be as top heavy. But like I said, if you're in a super short growing season, um, you may want to skip that part. All right, so I've got all of the tomatoes planted, the strings strung. I've got the peppers planted and staked. Everything got a really good watering in, and now we just watch them grow. I think this has been quite a long video, so if you're with me right now, thank you so much. You guys are awesome. If you could share this with a gardening friend, that would be great. 
you learned something or liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys next time.